Aye. for recording. Father God, we thank you for this evening. Please bless us as we delve into the study. May you open our eyes to see and to understand with our hearts the scriptures as you reveal them to us. May your spirit be present and guide us so that we learn and grow and become all that you desire for us to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, for those of you who are new joining us tonight, and there are a few of you here that haven't been here before since we started the study, uh, I gave a timeline out, and it's one of those things that makes judges very confusing, and it is that the first uh, chapter one isn't chronologically chapter one, that uh, chapter 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, the last five chapters of the book, actually predate the events of the judges. So it's, it's really kind of like he wrote the story of the judges, whoever the author is, and then tacked on at the end the explanation as to why we needed all these judges because here's how bad the nation was, okay? Uh, because all the events in those five concluding chapters actually happened before the first judge. Now we've gone through three chapters and in three chapters we've already encountered three judges because there's not much given. You get a little bit about, quite a bit about Deborah and Barak tonight. You get a whole lot about Samson, a whole lot about Gideon, but you don't get a whole lot about all the judges. So you look on here, we've done Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. We'll get quite a bit about Deborah and Barak, quite a bit about Gideon. We get hardly nothing about Tola and Jer. We get hardly anything about Jephthah, we, or Isben, or uh, Elon and Abdon, and then a whole lot about Samson. So while he's telling us about the judges, he's not giving us a whole lot of detail, okay? So tonight is Barak and Deborah. Uh, and so here we go. So you can read along in your Bible or however you want to do it. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Cana, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in... Heraseth Hagoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Where did my dog go? So you have the same pattern that we've already seen. The children of Israel did again did what was evil. What do we have already? That the first generation, after Joshua dies, after Caleb dies, the people do what's evil in the sight of the Lord. They did not remember the God who delivered them out of Egypt and led them through the wilderness. In other words, the issue was they did not, the, the, the adults did not hand the faith down to the children. And coupled with that, we saw last week that because they did not drive out the inhabitants of the land, they gave their daughters to marry the sons of the land and took the daughters of the land to marry for themselves. You know, but they start to intermarry with the people of the land with the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and all these people. And through their marriages, the, the, the pagan spouses led the men and women of Israel away from the God of Israel to worship their pagan gods. And that's so there's two things identified as the problem. They did not hand on the faith to the children and they intermarried with with unbelievers and that led to the downfall okay the corruption of the people so you've got Sisera the commander of the army Jabin the king of the Canaanites come here and he has 900 chariots of iron in a day and age where you don't have modernized mechanisms and weapons of war chariots were a big deal Pharaoh had chariots. It is the premium uh, instrument of war. Okay? So, the same pattern. They rebel against God and God brings the judgment. God uses Jabin, the king of Canaan, to be the instrument of judgment. And his, and his throne is in Hazar. So you see it above the Sea of Galilee. And that's where it appears on the map. Now there is a chariot that's not quite as old as this. This chariot is dated 600 years before Christ. We're talking probably 1,500 years before Christ, or something like 1,000 years before Christ in the time of the judges. So this is a little more modern chariot, but you can't find too many chariots still in existence that were that old uh, because they were all destroyed. But that gives you an idea 
of how they built their chariots, okay? Now, we get into Deborah. So, first of all, you've got the children of Israel have been subjugated to the Canaanites for 20 years. That is an awful long time. 20 years. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of uh, Jip Lapidith, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. What stands out to you right off the bat? She's sitting under the palm. Well, they're calling it. She's a woman. It's a woman. It's a woman. Okay, the, uh, so far all the judges have been men. And so the uh, we've got to get into this discussion real quick. The judge is not the same as a priest. Okay? They judged the people. They did not lead the people in worship. There's a difference. And we have to understand that difference in how God uses people throughout history. So we're going to, we're going to delve into that, but you can see... She's between Bethel and Ramah. Here's uh, <coughs> Bethel right here. And remember, uh, this guy that's judging them or, or controlling them, he's in a totally different region. He's in north of the Sea of Galilee. Okay? Uh, they've come a long way down to Bethel because it'd be north of here where the Sea of Galilee's at. So they were coming to her because she is well known. Okay. It would have been improper for a woman to have men come into her home. It was big no no. So she meets outdoors in a public place. The people come to her for judgment. Okay. Uh, so she's under a palm, notable place. People can find it. And they go to her. And what does a judge do? Pretty much discerns. Here's the situation, here's what you need to do. Or if there's two people with complaint, the judge works as kind of a mediator. I see here your side, I see your side, here's what you need to do. She's giving counsel and guidance, okay? How is it a woman that's called a prophet? It gets into understanding of what a prophet is, okay? God, doesn't God command only men to lead the people of God? First, what is the meaning of a prophet? The word prophet simply means a person who's chosen to speak the word of God. To prophesy is to speak forth the word of God to the people of God. Remember, this is not worship. The majority of what was spoken by the prophets of God was a word which was relevant to their day and age. So you pull out Isaiah, you pull out Ezekiel, you pull out Daniel. The vast majority of what they spoke was a message to the people of that day and that time. Intermixed in their teachings, the messages they gave, would be some speaking about future events, some prophecies. Very small amount. Maybe 5% of even that. 3% of what they taught were prophecies about the future. Most of it was relevant to their day. Okay? Okay. So in the midst of all they proclaimed, uh, there were statements of what God would do in the future. The prophets were preachers, not priests. <clears throat> Prophets did not lead the people in worship. They spoke God's truth to his people for, the benef for their benefit. In this context, obviously, usually repentance, because these were people who were rebelling against God who now are suffering the judgment of God because of their rebellion. There are many today who confuse the roles of men and women in the church. Is that true or false? True. true. Yeah. In the Old Testament, those who lead the people in worship of God were the priests. What tribe were the priests? Levi. Okay. So there were many in the tribe of Levi, Levi, but only the men and only a few were actually priests. Not every man in the tribe of Levi was a priest. Only certain ones. Okay. So you got the whole tribe, and from the whole tribe, God chooses some to be priests, not all of them. Just because the man went, just because someone was male did not give him a right to claim to be a priest. Only those whom God chose. Okay? Uh, there are many in the tribe of Levi, but only men and only a few were actually priests. Beyond the service, directly tied to the tabernacle and temple, God used both men and women to make his word known. 
<clears throat> so when you pull it away from the context of worship, God will use anybody. Yes, ma'am. How were the, the priests chosen? If God chose them, how were they chosen? They were typically chosen first by family lines, Aaron's line. Aaron was chosen to be high priest, his son, you know, high priest after him and so forth. All the others in Levi, in the tribe of Levi, they weren't even in line to be high priest. First, it was that actual descendants. And then if, if a man was chosen to serve as a priest, he was chosen by lot. Okay, Like Zechariah and Elizabeth were chosen by lot to go up and offer incense at the hour of prayer in the temple. And Gabriel appears to him and tells him uh, Elizabeth's going to have a child. But he's chosen by lot. And it may be a once-in-a-lifetime thing. Okay. Within the New Testament church, we are all the people of God. Okay. We all stand equal before God. Just as all our members, all the members of the tribe of Levi were Levites. In the same way, only some Levites were chosen to serve as priests, and those were always men. So God has chosen some Christians to serve as pastors in the church. Right. Those who are chosen to serve as pastors are always men. The pastor's job is to lead the people of God in the worship of God. So, here you go. It's not a male-female issue. Just because someone is male does not mean they can be a pastor. Okay? It's the individuals whom God chooses. How does God choose today? Pretty much, it's both the call and the heart. And the affirmation of the people. It's a both end. If you say, we don't want you to be our preacher anymore, then I'm out the door. Okay? It has to be both. It has to be one, that, I, that God puts in my heart the desire to do it. And two, that God puts it in your heart and you want me to do it. In your it's the people of God working together, following God's direction. Just because Dale is a man, he can't walk to church one day and say, today I'm going to be the preacher. He doesn't have that right. It's not a male-female issue. It's a call of God issue. Okay? Is that clear? So Deborah is not leading worship. And because she's not leading worship, once you step away from the actual worship, God will use any of us at any time for his purpose. So beyond the actual time of corporate worship, any Christian can be used by God to bring the word of God to the people who need it. Problem today is, what's the default answer? Only men can live. No, it's the preacher's job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the preacher's job. And yet it's not my job. It's your job to interact with the people in this world and share the truth of God with them and give wise counsel and direction to people, whether you're a man or a woman. Because once you step outside of what happens in, in worship, we are all called to minister in Christ's name to the world. I just do the formal part in the worship service. Yeah, but once we go out the door, then it's our responsibility. Exactly. And it's not a male or female issue. It's everyone. It's everyone. So in the same way Deborah taught the word of God to the people of God, it was not in the context of worship, but it was clearly instruction. In the church today, we need to find the proper balance, which can only be accomplished by allowing God's word to direct us. Now there is a list of the women who are called prophetesses, Women are used by God to teach the word of God to the people of God, never in the context of worship, but very directly they taught the word of God to people. Now, not every church understands it the same way. All right? They don't. Uh, Andy and Marcia uh, have had dealings in a church body. Uh, Kevin and Iris have had dealings in a different church body, okay, where... Basically, once a child got to be 11 or 12 years old, that child was never allowed to be instructed by a woman again. Period. Only men could do it. Show me that in the Bible. Please. Because Kevin and I had that experience in the church body totally separate from Andy and Marcia. Yeah. Because they... Okay. Young men were only allowed to teach males. Females could teach, but they could only teach women. Women mm -hmm. or young girls. It was totally separated. 
Right. And you just don't find that in the Bible. Okay. Why would it be? You know. Huh? Why would it be? That's what they don't understand. Why would it be in the Bible? Yeah. It's, you know, we have to separate the context of what happens in worship from the rest of the life of... Because, let's face it, the way we do church is not the way they did church 2,000 years ago. Right. Okay? When they did church 2,000 years ago, they came together at sunrise, probably, on a Sunday morning, and they were probably there until dark or after. And they might have three or four different men preach throughout the day. Okay? And all kinds of stuff going on. But once that day was over, it was a free-for-all to go out into the world and do what happened, you know, what the church needed to do in ministering to people. We, we do an hour on a Sunday of Sunday school and an hour for worship and an hour on Wednesday night. And that's pretty much it. We don't have, and, and what they did in worship is totally separate because what we do on Wednesday nights with eating and stuff is more like their Sunday morning worship. Because they came together and they spent the whole day together and they ate together, they prayed together, they sang together, they, they heard the word of God together. They did all stuff all day long. What we do is an adaptation of what they did. Well, today is not the same as it was 20 years ago. Exactly. Come on, Timothy. So, so it's in no way the same today. So, okay, how's it going? So, here's a list of those who were the women. You see, Deborah's the second one. Miriam, who was Miriam? Moses' sister. Okay, who was a prophetess who taught the people of God and, and worked right alongside Moses and Aaron during the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings. Uh Isaiah's wife is the one who gets me. You don't normally get that. You get read that passage. She's called a prophetess. Okay? Anna in the temple. Anna wasn't leading worship or anything. She was praising God and, and God, you know, what she said became scripture when she celebrated Jesus. Okay? Uh, four virgin daughters of Philip are called prophetesses. So, so back up. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Labadith, I didn't say that right. Was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under palm, the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the, up, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came to her for judgment. So she is not leading worship. She is giving Christian counsel or godly counsel, scriptural counsel to people. And then we get to this passage. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinayim, from Kadesh Naphtali. Nepali, I say that. And said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. How would she know that God had told Barak to do this? Unless God told her. Okay? The implication is that the Lord had told Barak to lead the armies of Israel, but he hadn't done it. So she's admonishing him, do what God told you to do. God is with you. If God's telling you to do this, God's going to use you. The problem is Barak doesn't have a whole lot of faith, all right? But to go to uh, Mount Tabor. Now here is Mount Tabor up here. Remember, she's down here. She's down here. We're in the hill country, which is near Bethlehem, and she's you know at Rama and Gilgal, and and Mama? she's telling him to go up here to Mount Tabor, which is not too far from Hazar. You see up there? Now we th we think of distances in Texas. Remember the the Promised Land, the way they measure Israel from Dan to Beersheba, north and south, 120 miles. Here to Avalon. That's the entire longest part of Israel. East and west, about 65 miles. Here to Big Spring. At its widest point. It is a small piece of land. So when you're talking going from, you know, down near the Dead Sea up to Sea of Galilee, we'll put it this way. When, when they left Nazareth, Joseph and Mary went to Bethlehem, it was less than 90 miles. 80, about 80 miles. Long way on foot. 
but it's not like Texas where you're going you know, hundreds of miles, okay? It's a relatively small piece of land. So when he tells them to gather the armies from uh, Naphtali and Zebulun to Mount Tabor, it's, you're not talking about traveling great distances. And notice, and how did the judges always work? In the region of land where the oppression was taking place, because like Samson, he'll deal with the Philistines. He's not going to deal with what's going up by the Sea of Galilee. He's going to deal with what's going over by the coast with the Philistines, where the Philistines are existing. What's wrong with you? Mommy. Mommy's out there. <laughs> He's chilling on No. Barak was directed by Deborah to gather his men in a very specific place, Mount Tabor. I'm going to show you a picture of Mount Tabor in just a second. And the area in which Deborah and Barak served was on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. The tribes called to battle were Naphtali and Zebulun. Their service to Israel corresponded to the lands allotted, allotments given to Naphtali and Zebulun. So those tribes are living in their designated areas. And in this particular area, Jabal, the, the king of the Canaanites, and Sisera, his commander, are oppressing them in the area they live. So the judge is from the area they live. He's to get men from the area where all this is happening and deal with the issue. They're not calling for the tribe of Judah down by Jerusalem to go up there and fight. These men, where we're living, are to rise up by God's command and go to battle against those who are oppressing them. Just like Gideon will rouse the people of his area to fight the Midianites. Okay? You're talking about the 12 tribes and their land allotments dealing with issues in their home territory. Kind of like Texas has to deal with theirs and then Mexico has to deal with theirs. And... Very much, yeah. So, I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you at the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I'll give him into your hand. So God's promise to Barak is to give Sisera into his hands Sisera is the leader of the Canaanite army. He leads these 900 chariots. Typically, Milo, come here. Typically, a chariot had two people, <clears throat> the driver and the one who was fighting. You couldn't drive and shoot a bow and arrow. You couldn't drive and deal with a spear very well. So you had the driver and the fighter. So in a minute, when it says that, that they wiped them all out, killed every last one of them, you know it's at least 1,800 men. There's two to a chariot. Okay. Now there's Mount Tabor. Uh, Andy grew up in a church that was Tabor Lutheran Church up in Nebraska, right? No, South Dakota. South Dakota. Named after this event, <laughs> okay? It's the only place in the Bible that Tabor shows up, Mount Tabor, right? And that's a picture of it from a distance. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not, the, the picture of that. Okay. Barak, in response to Deborah, says to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. What's the problem? No faith. A very weak faith, at least. Not to mention, I just find that interesting that a man would say to a woman at that time, yeah, mm -hmm. that and say, uh, if, you go, if you'll go with me, I'll go, but if you don't, I'm not going to go. Who was the woman in the Middle Ages that fought for England? Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc. There you go. You know, she went into battle, fought in armor, mm -hmm. and they followed her. Uh, Deborah, Deborah's not going to go into battle, but he's scared to go... And I guess there's this idea that if, if the chosen prophetess of God is with me, then God's going to be with me. He was not willing to take God at his word. How many people today are unwilling to take God at his word? They want some special dispensation, some sign, some proof, yeah. instead of taking him at his word. Barak is unwilling to simply take God at his word. He needs assurance. And, and in this case, Deborah's presence is the assurance. Okay, so Barak showed a lack of faith by refusing to go to battle without Deborah being present. When God leads us to do something, we don't need anyone else. If God puts it in your heart to do something, 
Don't let anything stand in your way. But I think that is something that all of us, men and women, deal with in the present time. Yep. For us to say, God told me to do this and I don't need you to help me. Or, you know, I don't need anyone but God to help me right. complete this. But most people aren't willing to step out in faith and take that initiative to do it because they're scared. Okay. John Lazar, Jesus saying that when he returns, will we find faith on the earth? Yeah. What? It's but say it louder. John, say that louder. Basically, it makes me think about what Jesus said when he returns, so will he find faith on the earth? Yeah. Where will he find it? Yeah. The, uh, you know, and, and Sandy's been around me long enough, she knows this. <laughs> Somebody will come to me with an idea. I don't want to do it. I had somebody come the other day wants to do a clothes a clothes pantry kind of thing where help women and children with clothing that they need. I know I want to do that. I, I actually not I am not going to do it. But the answer is yes. Because if God has put it on your heart to do it, there's a, there's no telling what God can do through you to accomplish that and bless a lot of people. I don't have to be involved in it. But if God's put it on your heart to do it, by all means, my answer to you is yes. And my answer when it comes to somebody wanting to do something in the church is always yes. Unless it's contrary to what God says. You know, if you want to sell cupcakes in the street corner every Sunday morning to raise money for the church and God puts her to do that, the answer is yes. You get out there in the rain and the snow. I don't care. You do it. If God's put in your heart, as long as it's not contrary to the word of God, the answer is always yes. Because I never know what God's going to do through you. We don't, if God is putting on your heart to do something, then we're supposed to step courageously out in faith and do it. And that's the point. It is a lack of faith not to trust in God and what he can do through us. We cower in the corner and think we need, you know, power in numbers kind of thing. And usually it's the individual that God uses to accomplish great things. Well, isn't that what faith really is, is taking God at his word? Yeah, part of it. Part of it. So, and she said, so Deborah's response to Barak, I will surely go with you. So yeah, I'll go. I don't have a problem with that. I'll go. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, you would think, just reading that, that Deborah's going to get the glory. But it's not Deborah. Okay? How would she know that God is going to use a woman to accomplish the victory? Again. I told her, you know, she is definitely demonstrating the fact that she's a prophetess and God is revealing things to her and working through her to, to speak the truth. And, and we can't argue with that. Okay. Now I'm going to take an aside real quick. Um, just hear me out for a second. I got so absolutely frustrated yesterday morning in my office studying, working on a sermon about Christmas. And the census, this was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, you know, moving Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. This sermon is actually for Christmas next year. Yeah. And I'm picking up commentaries and looking at stuff online, the commentaries, and they're all saying Luke was wrong. Luke got the date wrong. Quirinius didn't serve as governor until 6 AD, so Luke was wrong. These commentaries were written before they found the historical evidence that Quirinius had served in a, an official capacity for Caesar in the areas of, of, of um, Syria from about 8 BC until about 2 AD, then was reassigned in 6 AD to serve again. And since there wasn't any historical evidence, they're all saying Luke got it wrong. I want to throw them in the trash and burn them. Because how arrogant to say, because we can't prove something is true from our standpoint in history to doubt what the writers of Scripture said. Okay? We either believe the Scripture is the true, inerrant, infallible Word of God, or we throw it in the trash and go on. Okay? So, 
you know, now in this day and age, you go back and there's all kinds of historical evidence that, that shows that Quirinius Radius was there governing and, and they called the census and all, because they had a census every 14 years. Boom, boom, boom. Every 14 years there's a census during Caesar Augustus. Okay. And they can date them. So, so you go backwards. Census was 8 BC. That's the census that moved Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. Okay. Jesus is born in 8 BC. The guy that did our Julian calendar, pegging zero to the Christ, missed it in eight years. Our calendar's man made. Okay. So, anyway, uh, the woman, a woman is going to get the victory. Okay. So, Deborah agrees to go with Barak, but the consequences to his lack of faith will be that another receives the glory. Many times God wants to bless us through the service we render to him. When we fail to do as God directs, we miss the blessings God wants to give to us. God wants to use us. He wants to bless us. And when we fail to step out in faith and follow his lead, we miss the opportunity for the blessing. Just that plain and simple. Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with them, with him. So 10,000 men against the 900 chariots and other soldiers that we along with the chariots, wasn't just the chariots. Uh, Zebulun and Naphtali answered the call. I mean, granted, the people there were saying, hey, Deborah the prophetess is coming. Yes, we're going to go. It probably is a boost to their encouraging them, a boost to their confidence, there's no doubt. Okay. They follow on Barak's heels. The idea is they are following him. Without strong leadership, the people of God are often immobilized, okay? I put that in there because you see this with all the judges, and you see it still in the world today. God will use his people to accomplish great things, but it takes leaders to step out so the people can follow. And without someone leading, the people are stagnant. 20 years, these people, the, these tribes have been oppressed. And no one has stepped up to say, we can handle this. There's enough of us to deal with this. No one stepped up to lead. And when God put it and told Barak, you go lead, Barak refused. He didn't follow God's lead. And without leadership, the people suffer. Right? What's happening in our society today? I mean the church. The church. In general. Politics in general. We have Lack a strong we leadership. Have Without leadership, the nation suffers. We see that. We see it all the time. Okay? Now, here's an aside. Okay, Matt, we're going to take a little jog here. Uh, Heber, the Kenite, had separated from the Kenites. The descendants of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had pitched his tent as far away as the oak in Zanaim, which is near Kadesh. Okay? Seems out of place, but it becomes important in a little bit. The writer is giving us a preview. This guy is, you know, where are they meeting at? Uh, he's called Barak. Barak is called Zebedee and Naphtali to Kadesh. Okay? Same place. This guy has kind of gone out on his own. He's living in Kadesh. This is where all the armies are gathering. Okay? This is a descendant of Moses' father-in-law. Who is Moses' first father-in-law? Jethro, the priest of Midian. Who's this guy? The second wife. Has to be the second wife. Has to be the second wife. Okay? And I never noticed this before. It's Moses' father-in-law, but it's not Jethro, the priest of Midian. Afterwards, Moses married what? A woman from <clears throat> Ethiopia. After Zephora died, he married a black woman. And where'd she come from? I told you just before, where'd she come from? Ethiopia. I know, but she was with all the Israelites because when the plagues came on Egypt and, and Pharaoh finally said, take your people and go, all the slaves left, not just the Israelite slaves. All the other nationalities that were enslaved by Pharaoh left with them. And they traveled the 40 years in the wilderness with the Israelites. And when Moses' wife died, after his time of grieving, he decided, I'm going to get married again. And who did he marry? 
someone who wasn't an Israelite that was traveling with them in the wilderness during the 40 years. This is where that father-in-law came from. So he's probably a black man. Okay. When Sisera was told that Barak and the son of Abinom, I can say that, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the men who were with him from Haroseth Haggaiim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. That's a pretty good-sized army. Some of you have been in the military before. 10,000 men is a pretty good size. Thank you for noticing that. I can splice those together. So Deborah, what Deborah prophesied came true, the ultimate glory for the victory, the death of the enemy commander was given to a woman, not to Barak, which was a, which was a big deal because he was the leader. He was the one God had chosen, but because he wouldn't step out on faith, he didn't get the glory of the victory. He didn't get the blessing. Okay. God used him. He delivered the people. But he didn't get he didn't get the victory or the acknowledgement that he should have gotten if he'd done it God's way. Okay. Well, she must have been strong. Strong. Physically. Why? To have taken that tip head <clears throat> and hammered it through his head. <clears throat> Your temple's a pretty soft spot, and it yeah. wouldn't take much to go through it. Yeah. Right. But she we also one of the ones who put the tent up in the first place. Yeah. So we also <laughs> lose true. we also lose sight of the fact that <clears throat> the women of that culture in that day, because I was just doing this whole thing about traveling to Bethlehem, and you know what was Mary's life like as a young woman? I mean, you're talking, you know, up every day baking bread, manually hauling water, you know, Pretty hand washing strong. clothes. I mean, they had stamina because they had to work hard all the time. So the idea of walking from Nazareth to Bethlehem was not a big deal, except the fact she's nine months pregnant. That's what makes it a big deal. But the journey of walking and traveling, because when, she, when she's newly pregnant, she goes the same distance. Because to go to see Elizabeth is another town, but it's right outside Jerusalem, just like, just like Bethlehem is. So she travels the same distance when, she, when she's first pregnant and without any issue at all. The second time, she's nine months pregnant. That would have been the issue. A little more weight. A little more weight and just... And there's not a donkey in the story. You know that. Uh-uh. Probably realistically they had one, but it's, a, it's an assumption. So there's another artist rendition, if you want to call it that, <laughs> of Sisera. He's holding the carpet down. <laughs> so that day, God subdued Jabin the king of the of Cana before the people of Israel. And the hand of the people of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Cana until they destroyed Jabin, king of Cana. So without his army, his whole empire falls. After 20 years of subjugating the people of God, at least that region of the people of God, Naphtali and Zebulun, they're freed. His reign is over. Now remember, there are Canaanite kings all over the place. Canaanite tribes all over the place. Just like there are many Philistines, there's five lords of the Philistines and all the different tribes, and they, they're the always buying for power. to drive them all out. Yeah. Now, then you have Deborah's song. And I'm not even going to begin to... Uh, try to analyze, I pulled this from somebody who knows more about it than me, eight stanzas of the song, and each stanza uh, gives you a different aspect of what she's singing and praising about. Okay. Um, and it's part of scripture. God gave her this song, just like Mary's Magnificat. Okay, Elizabeth's words, all this is scripture. And it means, it definitely means something. But, it, but I'm not a poet, okay? Um, now, I'll tell you something. I was doing some studying today and ran across something written in 1914 or 1916. Uh, a man wrote a poem 
called Sunday Morning, a poet. And you know what the theme of the poem is? A woman is sitting, having her coffee on a Sunday morning. She's not going to church. This is the 19 teens, not going to church because she has grown so sophisticated. She doesn't need God. She doesn't need these archaic beliefs about Jesus and his virgin birth and the resurrection and all this. He writes this poem because he sees this happening in the culture in the 19 teens. I read the poem, I pulled it off, saved it. It's poetry, it makes no sense to me for the most part. It's difficult to read, but that's the message. And so the stuff we've been struggling with, it's every generation. It's every generation. Why? Because we, like the children of Israel, are not handing on the faith to our children like we should. Okay. So, how much time we got? We got enough time to read this poem. And then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinam, sang on that day, saying, "For the leaders in it, for the for the leaders leading in Israel, the people volunteering, bless the Lord." Hear, you kings, listen, you dignitaries. I myself, to the Lord, I myself will sing. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, what's the, now notice, if you haven't paid attention to this, in all caps, remember the difference? When it's capital L, lowercase O-R-D, it'd be the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord or Master. When it's all caps, it's Yahweh, the Hebrew, okay? So they're calling God by his personal name, okay? I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Lord, when you went out of Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth quaked, the heavens also dripped, the clouds also dripped water, the mountains flowed with water at the presence of the Lord. This Sinai at the presence of the Lord, the God of Israel. The places he's mentioned, Seir and Edom, that's near Sinai. What did God do for the people? He gave rivers of water in the midst of the desert. Okay, there's the image of that. What, uh, have you seen those pictures? You know, the split rock of Horeb, they've got a picture of the of this, this yes. granite washed smooth because it's had millions of gallons of water rushing over it. Around the edges, it's gruff granite, but where the water ran, so much water it ran, it has washed the stone smooth. Granite has been washed smooth and it's still there. It's amazing. In the days of Shamgar, one of the previous judges that we only got a little bit about last week, you know, a couple of verses, the son of Anoth, in the days of Jael, the roads were deserted and travelers went by roundabout ways. Why? Because they were oppressed. They were hiding. Okay? The peasantry came to an end. They came to an end in Israel. Until I, Deborah, arose. Until I arose, a mother in Israel. New gods were chosen. Then war was in the gates. Not a shield or a spear was among the 40,000 in Israel. A heart goes out to the commanders of Israel. What's, it, what's she saying? No one's going to fight. The men of Israel are cowering. They're scared. No one's going to fight until she rallied. Okay? A heart goes out to the commanders of Israel. The volunteers among the people, bless the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets, you who travel on the road, shout praise at the sound of those who distribute water among the watering places. There they will recount the righteous deeds of the Lord, the righteous deeds for his peasantry in Israel. Then the Lord, then the people of the Lord went down to the gates. Awake, wake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song, arise, Barak, and lead your captives, son of Abinam. Then survivors came down to the nobles, the people of the Lord came down to me as warriors. From Ephraim, those who root, whose root is Amalek came down, following you, Benjamin, with your peoples. From, I can't say these names, Makar, commanders came down. And from Zebulun, those who wield the staff of office and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. As was Issachar, so was Barak. Into the valley they rushed at his heels among the divisions of Reuben. What it sounds like is we've got the story of Barak fighting Sisera and the Canaanites. But it sounds like other tribes began to rise up and fight against the people that were oppressing them. So, you know, gaining courage from this. That's what it sounds like. 
We don't have any historical references of that. But it would make sense. God is delivering his people from bondage. Again. There were great determinations of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the flocks? Among the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead remained across the Jordan. And why did Dan stay on ships? Asher sat by the sea, at the seashore and remained by its landing. Zebulun was a people who risked their lives, and Naphtali too, on the high places of the field. So what are the others, what were they doing? They weren't fighting. They were just sitting around. But Zebulun and Naphtali were at the time. Okay, so she's kind of criticizing some of them. The kings came and fought, and then the king of Cana fought, and Tanik near the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder and silver. The stars fought, fought from heaven. And from their paths, they fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, my soul march on with strength. Then the horse's hoofs beat from the galloping, the galloping of, mighty, of his mighty stallions. Yeah. Uh, curse, Miraz, said the angel of the Lord, utterly curse, it's an utterly curse, curse its inhabitants because they did not come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the, against the warriors. It just keeps going. I mean, and she's just singing this big, long song. And we don't have all the historical context to it. She's praising God. She's giving, lauding some of the tribes, criticizing some of the tribes, calling out specific events that we don't know. She knows it. It happened. We don't have all the answers. That's okay. What, what she's telling us is God was faithful in all these events. Was well, blessed... Of women is Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Most blessed is she of women in the tent. He asked for water, she gave him milk. In a magnificent bowl, she brought him curds. She reached out her hand for the for the tent peg and her right hand for the workman's hammer. Then she struck Sisera and smashed his head. And she shattered and pierced his temple. Between her feet, he bowed and fell. He lay between her feet. He bowed, he fell, where he bowed. There he fell dead. So she's praising in the what what happened? What was the prophecy? That a woman would get the glory. Say that again. That a woman would get the glory. Out of the window she looked and wailed. The mother of Sisera. Now notice he switched. The mother of Sisera. Okay. Out of the window she looked and wailed. The mother of Sisera through the lattice. Why does his chariot delay in coming? Why do the hoofbeats of his chariots delay? Her wise princesses would answer her. Indeed, she repeats her words to herself. They are not finding. They are not dividing the spoils. A concubine, two concubines for every warrior. To Sisera, a spoil of dyed cloth, a spoil of dyed cloth embroidered, dyed cloth of double embroidery on the neck of the plunderer. May all your enemies perish in this way, Lord. But may those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its might. His own mother is bemoaning the fact he hasn't returned from war. And what's the assumption? Maybe they're dividing the plunder. But he's laying dead with a tent peg in his head. <laughs> okay? She's just, I don't know. And the land had rest for 40 years. Amen. They were oppressed for 20. They had rest for 40 the next judge to rise up is who? Do you know? What's your list say? It's Gideon. It's Gideon. Now we get a lot more. This was the first time we've got some kind of fleshed out of the story. The other judges, very little. We get quite a bit with Gideon. And, and again, Gideon, we have the same thing. We have a man of Israel who is scared to go fight unless he has signs from God. What's Gideon's sign? Remember? The fleece. Put out the fleece. If it's Lord, let the let the let the, the fleece be wet and the ground be dry. He did it too. And God did it. And let, let the ground be wet and the fleece be dry. And God did it. He's giving these signs to affirm, yes, I've chosen you to do this. He, he, <laughs> he, he's unwilling to venture forth. Okay? He needs proof. They're showing us a human weakness. 
And so often we fail to step out in faith. And that's what we see with Barak. We see that with Gideon. God ends up using Gideon in a great way. We'll see that next week. And, and unlike a lot of our studies, this study is going very fast because it's mainly history. It's not like application passages for the most part like we have when we went through Romans on Sunday morning. It's a, it's a quicker history, okay? So we're going pretty fast. Any closing thoughts? Are you going to sing the song for us? No. The only reason I came. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I will not make you suffer like that. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for letting us be here tonight. Thank you for opening the pages of Scripture and helping us to understand your faithfulness and that you will accomplish your will even at times when we are faithless. Give us the courage to move forward and follow your lead. And may you, Father, receive all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God be with you all tonight.